harder than ever. That's right. Uh, everybody get this brochure? Okay, because like I made a bunch of these, and I'm not a graphic designer, I am a text guy. So the fact that it actually all is readable is a huge accomplishment for me. And then there's even also shapes and stuff. So, you know, I, I use the template though, so some of you guys are gonna say, there's too much white space or there's too little, I don't know, I'm sorry. Just, it's baby steps, okay? So, um, this is, uh, this is a, a, an event that's sponsored by the uh, University Caucus uh, of LMDA. We've been doing it since 1992. It was first founded under Susan Jonas when Anne Caneo was the, uh, 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 the president, and uh, so uh, LMDA was founded in 85, I think, so this is a long-standing tradition. I am very, very, very deeply honored to be able to be the guy who's presenting it to you. For those of you who don't know me, I should just probably introduce myself. My name is Michael Chemers. Uh, I'm the Director of Graduate Studies at the University of California Santa Cruz Theater Arts Department. Uh, yeah, Santa Cruz! Uh, formerly, I was the uh, director of the, I was the founding director of the BFA program in production dramaturgy at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah! yeah. Where was where's CMU at? CMU? Okay, great. Awesome. So happy. To, yeah, so happy to see you guys. Um, and, uh, and then I wrote this book called Ghostlight, which is like, I don't know, uh, people like it. So, um, I just, I want to share with you that I just found out that it's being translated into Spanish. Uh, by, um, by Ana Lola Santana. We're going to work on it together. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, Super excited about that. Uh, you can also read it in Korean um, and Farsi. Uh, okay, enough about that. Um, I am, I can't tell you how honored I am and how happy I am because the people that I'm standing on the stage with, or who are sitting on the stage with me while I'm standing, are people, uh, in some cases, who have, whose work I've admired for many years has been very inspirational to me. But we are also bringing in some new faces, some new voices. Uh, we have a, a really wonderfully diverse group up here of um, people at different with different uh, approaches to their work, uh, to our work, all sort of con conjoining together in this field that we call dramaturgy, which we refuse to define exactly what it is. This is why. Um, so, without further ado, because enough of my yakking, um, the, the plan is that uh, what we've done is we've invited these uh, amazing people up here to talk about the hottest thing that they're working on right now, the thing that they're most passionate about, the thing that they know the most about, whatever it is, for five minutes. And five minutes exactly. And uh, Levine over there is gonna be keeping time, and she'll give them a two and a one, and then following that, I'm gonna come on with a hook. And bring them off. But we're really, it's a hard five, so this is, this is the, the tradition, and we respect it. Um, Okay, and then hopefully, uh, if I can shut up and get moving on this, we will have um, some time afterwards to answer questions. But really, what this is, is what Lessing called fermenta cogitationis, which is um, uh, fermentation for thought, right? Food for thought. But I like his idea, it's like, it's like making alcohol, right? Ferment, fermenting thought. And so the idea is that after you see this, for the rest of the conference, you're going to be running up to people and going, oh my god, you said that thing, and I really want to know more about it, and here's my part, and here's, right, you're like, and, and please can we collaborate on this cool idea that I've got, and I really want to learn more. That's the idea. So do that, because that, we are theater people at the end of the day, right? I mean, we're bookish, but we're theater people, and so that means two things. One is, we hate getting up early, and, and the second thing is, that, yeah, it's true. And the second thing is that we are great collaborators, right? And so that's what we do, right? Unlike the other scholars that I work with in other fields, excuse me, <laughs> we are really good collaborators. All right, so, shutting up and getting on with the thing. All right. Our first speaker needs no introduction. <laughs> I always wanted to do that. Our first speaker uh, is the author of a book that's very important to me uh, towards dramaturgical sensibility. Woo! Yes! Formerly a professor at Villanova, where I just did an external review. Um, and currently, uh, actually not currently anymore, but as of uh, just a few days ago, emeritus of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, where he has trained an entire generation of dramaturgs. Uh, former president of this organization, my mentor, my friend, Jeff Brown. Ready, Olivia? The mic on? I'm on. Oh, the mic check. It's not going to be on my phone. 
Adapturgy, uh, the dramaturg's art and theatrical adaptation. Shakespeare in three dimensions, the dramaturgy of Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet. Physical dramaturgy, perspectives from the field. New media dramaturgy, performance media and new materialism. The practice of dramaturgy, working on actions and performance. Dance dramaturgy, modes of agency, awareness and engagement. Bond and Neon, working with Pina Bausch. Adventures in Feminist Dramaturgy, The Road Less Traveled, Staging the Spanish Golden Age, Translation and Performance, Essential Dramaturgy, The Mindset and Skill Set, The Hamburg Dramaturgy by Jean E. Lessing, A New and Complete Annotated English Translation, Dramaturgy in Motion, at Work on Dance and Movement Performance, Natya Shastra, English Translation with Critical Notes, the Lambda Online Archive, which now has the review, Lambda Conference Materials from 87, Newsletters from 2012, and just now, Canadian Loose Letters from 1988 and on. A Man of Letters, the Selected Dramaturgical Correspondence of Richard Correa, the Redlich Companion to Dramaturgy, a Theory of Dramaturgy, Dramaturgy and Making a User's Guide for Theater Practitioners, New Dramaturgy, International Perspectives on Theory and Practice, Dramaturgy and Architecture, Theater, Utopia, and the Built Environment. Quickly, what do they all have in common? Ellen Gear. Ellen Gear, good, I'm not sure about that. Anything what else? Yeah, dramaturgy, good. Collins, right? <laughs> yeah, that. Um, they're all, uh, they're, they're in English. What? They're all recent? Yeah, they're all recent, right? They're all in the last five years. And finally, none of them appear at Lambda's online bibliography. Uh, it has, in fact, no entries at all after 2013. Which is, I think, we can all agree, <laughs> appalling. <laughs> and we should no doubt have a word with whoever's responsible <laughs> and delete their membership forever. I'm going to fix that. At which point I would vanish. Okay, so. Or with Michael Chimmers, blessing as head of university relations, we might go in search of anyone who would like to work on updating this resource by taking a year from 2014 to the present, tracking down what's there, reading it, and then coming back uh, maybe a year from now to have a brilliant conversation about where we are and where we need to go as a field. At the same time, and for similar reasons, we need to update the Lambda chronology, a timeline that notes events we should not as a community forget, such as where was the last conference and who organized it. A chronicle that will, in addition to serving future grant writers and yet unborn historians, simplify late night, semi-inebriated inebriated conversations at the conference bar. So uh, with Martine and Brian's blessing, we're looking for individuals to take one of the past five years in the life of LMDA and bring it up to date. Documents like these, however mundane, are foundational to the ways in which we dramaturg ourselves. They are critical to our ability to have informed conversations about where we have been and where we are going as a discipline. Uh, these texts remind us of the breadth and depth of the histories we share. They return us to conversations about what constitutes a text, about the distinctions we make between translations and adaptations between primary and what we might think of secondary, and perhaps most fundamentally, uh, quoting from James' book, how stories evolve and mutate to fit new times in different uh, places. Dance dramaturgy, dramaturgy in motion, working with Pina Bausch, and in particular physical dramaturgy, ask us to consider the relationship between dramaturgy and various forms of embodiment. What, for example, do we learn about ourselves when we do or do not put the word physical in front of the word dramaturgy? Is the body saying to us, I'm in some way more fundamental, more primal than all your thinking and your text? Or is it perhaps saying, I want to be included in all this dramaturgy talk? I'm tired of people calling me a movement coach if that means they see me only as someone who comes in for a rehearsal or two to teach everyone how to bow. So, <laughs> I invite you to join us in this work if you have time, or maybe even if you don't. And if you've published in one form or another, one language or another work before or after 2014 that should be in this bibliography but isn't, please be in touch. Thank you. Okay, I feel a little called out. Uh, and, um, thank you, Jeff. For
for reminding us uh, of this. Please, anybody who wants to get involved with this, um, there's information about the bibliography in this old pamphlet. My email is in here. Reach out to me. Uh, we'll get it done. We'll get it done this year, I promise. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, our next speaker uh, is, was my former classmate at uh, the PhD program at the University of Washington, along with Ken Trinelia. There he is, Nick Ken. Former president of LMBA, Ken. Uh, this is her first LMBA. But yes, that's right. She's a very accomplished scholar in the field of eco-criticism and, uh, and many other things, and was a member of Grotowski's Mountain Project back in the day. Um, um, please welcome, uh, from the University of Oregon, my friend, Teresa May. so much of my ancestry, but the need for indigenous decolonizing methodologies to inform our approaches to dramaturgy, to production, and or the teaching of Native and First Nations plays. We've had a lot, and happily so, um, indigenous playwrights and productions uh, move into the spotlight across the country. In Oregon, I think it was uh, a couple of years ago, there were uh, three Native uh, female playwrights uh, work on the three major stages in the state of Oregon. Um, maybe the Dakota Access Pipeline sort of woke us up some. Um, maybe um, it's many other things coming together, including the incredible work of indigenous dramatists. Um, and many companies, like Oregon Shakespeare Festival, are taking steps to make sure that indigenous methodologies inform those productions. Respecting indigenous protocols, ways of knowing, um, often mean the difference between projects that contribute to decolonization and those that merely reinscribe hegemonic patterns of artistic and intellectual colonization. And I think dramaturgs, though I'm not a practicing dramaturg, I have to confess that. Um, I am a historian and a practitioner and a, a, a working artist. But dramaturgs, it seems to me, are in a particularly unique position strategically to practice decolonizing in the academy and in theater generally. I'm speaking a little bit more to the, um, the academics, my fellow academics, because I know that in professional theater, a lot of this work is already being done. But in the academy, we're a little bit slower to catch up. So how do we work? And, and one of those reasons, as Rick Knowles and Monique Mojica point out, is that the academy is one of the major technologies of disempowerment over many years. And research itself has been a tool of colonization. Two minutes, are you kidding me? So uh, <laughs> speak slow. Um, but I was just thinking, you know, even about the dramaturgy of this place. Columbia University in Chicago and thinking about where that name come from, the 1893 Columbia Exposition, where there was a place called the White City in which they exhibited indigenous bodies from around the world um, as if acting out the John Gast, you know, the goddess Columbia coming across, you've all seen that painting, Columbia coming across the prairies. Um, so the course of empire continues unless we 
actively, proactively stop it. So we need to educate ourselves about the epistemologies, the values of specific tribes in the regions in which we work, the protocols, um, and there's three uh, methodologies that are called out by indigenous um, theorists that I think are worth just tagging right now and we can talk later. I also brought a little bibliography. One is centering relationship as opposed to centering product or centering money or centering timeline. We've got to get the show up, but no centering relationship means being there for the long haul, means reaching out. Centering consultation, meaning having indigenous people on board in the production process, um, having their input shape the product and giving back. That question, you know, um, Eve Tuck says, decolonization is not a metaphor. And what she means is, it's actually about giving land back. So there's an opportunity to give back, you know, I don't own land, but I can give back space, I can give back permission, I can give back inclusion, I can give back honor, I can give back generosity, I can give back opportunity. And I think, um, uh, anyway, dramaturgs are in quite a position to do that, um, I think, both in the academy and theater. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, fantastic. Welcome. Welcome to our organization. Um, all right. Our next speaker uh, is the Teresa Helburn Chair of Drama at Bryn Mawr um, and is a veteran of Actors Theatre of Louisville, uh, the Wilma Theatre in Philadelphia, founder of his own theatre company, uh, uh, Big House in Philadelphia. Yeah. And, hmm? Sorry. And a um, uh, professor also taught at Yale and Curtis and you name it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Lord. device that's to sort of like get at some pieces of truth. I don't believe that I'm like articulating any like essential truths about the universe. Uh, and every, kind of every piece of what it is that I say is like debatable, quibbleable, and adaptable and revisable. So like make your own tool. Um, first, so like I'm making a, I'm making a grid uh, to sort of spread out what it is that I do with my time, or what it is that I might do with my time. So along the left side of this piece of paper or grid, which is actually like a real piece of paper you can see, <laughs> um, I've, I've divided um, what it is that I might do into the phases of evolution that are roughly adapted from um, uh, phases that Myra Raflowitz uses to talk about the work of the open theater. Um, and, and these four categories are um, practices, which I think of as activities or behaviors, uh, research, which is a place to um, uh, do inquiry, to apply curiosity, and where there is no predicted end result, right? It's sort of free floating inquiry. Development which is the place where I imagine myself kind of moving something from one place to another, right? Like getting a draft done, um, making like one version of a project. Um, and then the last category is finishing, uh, which is executing, reflecting, and revising. Right, so that's like, that's kind of one thing. And then I imagine, like, along that, I don't imagine, I have on my piece of paper, <laughs> uh, the spheres in which I imagine that I might be active in my life. So I start, like, way over, I sort of imagine, like, vaguely, but not totally, concentric circles, um, where, like, I have my personal life over on the left, and then I sort of move into my creative life, my teaching life, uh, my professional life, which I distinguish from my creative 
and teaching lives. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to call my civic life. But there are also others. Like those are things that I thought we might largely have in common. Uh, but lots of us have lots of spheres in which we choose that we might be active. And one of the things that I want to do with my tool is to figure out what are the spheres that are not uh, that are not present that I'm not working in. Um, and then if, if you sort of do this this grid work on your own piece of paper, uh, you see that there's like a lot of squares. Right, so I have a place where uh, my personal practice can be identified, which is the stuff that I do every day to be me, taking care of myself. Um, and then next to that, I have my creative practice. And some of those behaviors that I do every day to be an artist are also things that I do to take care of myself, right? So if I meditate, which I don't do every day, but if I meditate, like that's gonna show up in more than one place. Um, and then I have like, a set of teaching practices which have to do with like keeping up to date things and etc. But there's like there's these 25-ish um, squares and I can look at that and I think that I'm in the process of doing now is to look at it and say like oh well where do I actually spend my time? Um, turns out that the place that I actually spend my time is on things that other people are going to notice um, and where I'm going to get in trouble if I don't do the thing that I'm supposed to do. <laughs> um, what's, what's harder, but I feel like it's necessary and my grid is showing me, um, is like these things like personal research. Well, like that's not even a category that I think in. But, but this dramaturgical school is telling me, yeah, that it's according to your grid. You should be doing some research, maybe even every day into what it is that it feels like to be you. Not achievement-oriented things, like that's your personal development. You've got that stuff to do too. Um, and I guess I, I'd encourage you to try this out. See what you think. Um, think about like what spheres you would add that like we don't have in common. Um, and I'd love to talk to anybody who like, feels like they're making some kind of progress in what it is that they're thinking about themselves. Thanks. Wow, that's that is a hot topic. <laughs> Myself. <laughs> um, okay, our next speaker is a celebrated translator of French and German uh, plays. Uh, is an accomplished theater historian and someone who, when you get to know him, is absolutely hilarious. From Knox College, right here down the street in Galesburg, Illinois, Neil Black. Okay, I actually don't even have any notes, so this, this could be a big mistake, we'll find out. Um, in theory, I talk about what I'm about to talk about all the time, which is why I think I can talk about it without having notes in front of me. Um, so the title that Mickey gave me is The University Dares. The University Dares to do what? The, what I'm advocating for is for universities and colleges to dare to stage plays in translation. Um, my starting point here is is, is in part recognition that um, while I and others who do the same kind of work as me spend a lot of time encouraging professional theatre companies to, to do plays in translation in the US and in the UK, but particularly in the US, I'm aware that that's a, that's a hard fight um, for reasons that I understand even though they frustrate me on a daily basis. I mean, I've had some success with having productions done at um, American um, professional theatre companies, but um, something that, that, uh, that Adam and I have established in the course of our efforts to advocate for plays in translation is that the university and college um, environment is one that lends itself much better to, to the risk-taking involved. I mean, I do understand, especially in a country where you can't even get people to go to see movies with subtitles, I do understand, that as, as well as various economic, cultural considerations, why theatre companies are loath to take the, the risk, supposed risk, of doing a play in translation, even if the play, well, what's frustrating about it is partly that we're talking about, in some cases, about plays that have been, you know, have been, had had multiple productions elsewhere in the world, whether it's, you know, in, in Europe and Latin America, there's a, there's a really, the, 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 um, the ecosystems, in, ecosystems in the different countries vary enormously. Um, 
But colleges and universities are in very different positions. And I know only some of the people in the room work for colleges and universities, but I would hope that those of you that work in professional fields also have, uh, in some cases, ongoing relationships with uh, institutes of higher education or certainly friendships with people who work at them. Um, the idea is, you know, my idea is that it's, and I've done this myself, it's, it's, um, it's much less of a risk for a, for a theatre department. I, I was in a fortunate position, I will admit, because we were, my department um, was never box office driven. But I think that even if it had been, I would have made the case that, it, that we were in a position where we could take the risk of trying a, a new translation, uh, a, a, the first uh, translation of a play by Eval Palmatshofer or Grifero or whoever it might be. Um, one thing is that, of course, if you do the first pr production of a play at a college or university, it's the college world premiere. It's not the world premiere. So it's not as if you're um, taking away from the theatres that um, prize that they value so much of being able to say that they're doing the premiere. So there have been cases of um, plays that I've um, translated that have been done at colleges and, and, then, and then have been done professionally. Um, I'm, another point I want to make is there's, there's sort of more of this going on than, than even I have realized. Um, I'm actually organizing a panel at a literary translation conference in November uh, where I'm going to bring together people who've done this, who've directed plays in translation with students, um, and I heard from more people than I'd expected to, and there are, there are a lot of people um, doing this kind of work out there that we don't even know about. Um, I think in particular of people who, like, like me, until, um, uh, until I retired, um, there are a lot of people who work in theatre departments, especially small ones, who direct, and they often have to direct one production a year. And no sooner have you gone into to design meetings for one production that you, than, than your chair asks you, well, what are you going to do? We need to plan the season for next year. Um, it's kind of this incessant cycle. And once you reach the point where you've had a go at Molière, you've had a go at Shakespeare, you've done your Chekhov, like, I think there are people out there who, you know, and they, they can do the, they can make the obvious choice of doing whatever the play is that uh, American theatre tells us is the most produced theatre, you know, play in regional theatre everywhere. But I think there's a real um, scope for, um, for introducing a kind of, a different kind of diversity, international diversity. And I'm aware that, you know, the German and French work that I tr translate might not bring in the greatest variety, but, you know, there are people out there translating plays from Arabic and from other languages too. Um, how do you find these plays? Well, one thing, um, Adam and I have an organization, Adam and I and others, called um, Tint Theatre and Translation Network. We have a website that I'm in the process of trying to um, build out, but I have included a list in there of um, productions that have, have been done at colleges, and I'm going to keep building that out. The, uh, the, the, the web address is tintnet.org. My phone is ringing goodbye. <laughs> Uh, and that's Adam Versenia right there. Yeah, wave Adam. So if anybody wants to know about more about theater and translation, these are the guys. Um, okay, our next speaker, when we got Jeff Prohl, I thought, can we get a match set? Can we get the entire dramaturgy faculty at the University of Puget Sound? And we did! <laughs> From the University of Oregon, uh, my friend, who's their next speaker, is an award-winning historian with a very strong focus on women playwrights and a dramaturg and a director, I believe, also in her own right, Sarah Freeman! are probably not um, the right mode anymore, and that that navigation through people 
um, makes me feel powerful, but it's not collaboration. Okay, Ooh. next, um, I want to have, uh, I want to give you the frame um, that we talk about in our department sometimes because of my colleague Jess Smith. She talks about, from her graduate work with um, Anne Bogart, talking about how people in artistic processes are sort of beginners, middlers, or enders. They tend to love one part of that process or be particularly good at that part of the process. And the first time she brought that up, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a beginner or an ender. I'm definitely a beginner and ender. And the great problem of my life right now, which is middle age, and also um, my artistic processes is that everything is the middle. <laughs> so I'm trying to learn how to be a middler. OK. So uh, when last night was here at Hot Topics in Toronto, I um, shared about the Civil Rights Performance Walk I was in the midst of developing for the fourth quadrennial race and pedagogy conference at the University of Puget Sound that, was going to, that happened in the fall of 2018. The project builds on my research about British alternative theater, uh, theaters and their experimental forms, um, my interest in political theaters, and my reading of important strands of dramaturgical analysis um, and innovation from the last 20 years that have largely been grounded at this conference by some of my co-presenters and other collaborators and people I admire. Um, I had just at that point spent a semester working on a project in dramaturgy class. Um, going into local archives and trying to develop the possible routes for the walk. Our goal was to have this sort of um, interactive immersive experience ready for the fall 2018 uh, Race and Pedagogy National Conference. And at the time, in June 2018, I confessed to you that I didn't really know um, what I was doing or if or how I was going to get there, but I knew what the questions were and um, that I was excited about my collaborators. I'm here to report that uh, what I could do by the fall of 2018 was put together a couple audio stories and make a couple routes and share at the conference, but that I learned uh, that this project that I had envisioned was not an 18-month process, which I thought at the time was even a long process, um, but it's more like a five-year process. <laughs> And that I've had, I moved the goal from the 2018 conference to the 2022 conference. Um, I'm really thankful that my colleagues in the Department of African American Studies at the University of Puget Sound and the Department of Theater are people who are not sprinters, <laughs> who have a really long-term vision and who have been kind and generous to me as I learned in my middle age not to focus on the sprints um, and to continue supporting me in this project. So, three reasons that I needed to expand this project and work on being in the middle. Me, what I needed to do, and how I needed to grow, and how long I needed to be in phases of research and process and practice before I could actually develop. Second, time with the community. This is the most community-based work I've ever done, and it takes so, so much more work, and I have so many more spaces that I need to be in and listen in. And uh, three students, um, in, in terms of including my students in it and spending time with them to digest, also need to do that much more slowly, much more long term. Um, and so, it's also really hard to do this work when you're in the middle of doing a bunch of administrative work. I'm in the part of my career where I'm department chair and um, where we've been hiring. I'm super excited to introduce a new colleague to you in the future, where I've been accepting the transition of the extremely valued senior colleagues becoming emeritus. Um, and I'm also the faculty senate chair at my campus and we're rewriting our curriculum. <laughs> so uh, I'm, in the, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be in the middle of this project. Um, but what I know is that dramaturgical processes are deep and they're long and I'm thankful to be able to walk on with them and through them here and in my home. The thing about hot topics is that, that we get these really great ideas and we just start to explore them and then we gotta move on. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is a graduate of the master's program at San Diego State and is currently in the performance studies program at NYU, all right? Emphasis in uh, this very, very important emerging subfield um, about which I know very little and I'm very eager to learn more uh, dance dramaturgy. Desiree Fernandez! So whenever I walk 
into a room, I can't help but recognize who falls in um, the minority or the majority, whose body, background, identity boxes them into othered or the excluded. In performance, when approaching a work that directly relates to a certain culture, um, identity, community, we must tread lightly. We must care for this work with soft yet strong hands, educated minds and good intentions, and of course, someone of that group or someone who specializes in that context should always be in the room. However, how do we as dramaturgs, as creative collaborators, include the excluded? Many may argue, well, why should we include them in the first place? The answer is because we are creative collaborators. We carry a dramaturgical awareness, consciousness, and responsibility in order to create, to grow, to nurture work that doesn't just impact the audience, but our artists. We need to help each other feel included. I'm not advocating that we always have to serve as educators because as a woman of color, I understand and carry that burden and do not believe it is my duty to have to constantly be the voice and informant in the room. However, as dramaturgs, we serve as reminders of the importance of research, of educating ourselves, and creating an atmosphere of respect, trust, and a safe space. When working as a dramaturg, dancer, choreographer, and assistant director on Milta Ortiz's Mas, this issue came up a lot during design meetings, production meetings, and even rehearsals. Moss is a docudrama about the dismantling of the Tucson Unified School District um, and their Mexican American Studies program, taking place in Temescal, a sweat lodge, um, in the form of redemptive remembrance, mind gods, witness, and harness the energy and space for these narratives. While engaging topics such as Chicanismo, feminism, racism, politics, students, teachers, friends, and family preserve their identity in a society that prides itself of being a melting pot. I was made aware that there were white designers and even cast members who felt uncomfortable, who felt they had no connection and furthermore had no right to create for this production. When bringing this concern up to my director, he said, well, it's good for them to feel uncomfortable. If they walk into a room of people who all look the same but not like themselves, well, then they finally understand how we feel. So it's not our job to make them feel better about this. I disagree. I want to welcome artists who feel like they don't belong, this coming from someone who holds many identities and constantly feels like an outcast. I want artists to feel uh, encouraged, to feel included, to have empathy. I inform the cast and the designers that though I appear or seem to be included in the subject matter, based on the color of my skin and my ethnic background, I have a tongue of English but ears of Tagalog and Spanish. I'm a woman with brown skin always trying to act white in order to assimilate. My appearance is Latina, but my blood boils Filipino, but my mouth can't support my heritage. I have never belonged to any identity. To be mezcla is to be unknown, misunderstood, anti whatever you want me to be. I am working to embrace the uncomfortable and use that as a way to fight to reclaim my own identity. In the next production meeting, after discussing my goals as a dramaturg with the director, I addressed the creative team and said, I want everyone to know in the room that you are in this room because you have the right to work on this production. And if you don't feel that way, I would like to welcome you to have a conversation with the director and myself. If you feel disconnected, then simply connect. Connect with the culture, the stories, the context, as we dramaturgs do. Learn and grow and use that to influence your work, not to restrict it or limit it. In the Mexican American Studies program, they began each class with the poem En La Cache by Luis Valdez. It starts, Tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mi mismo, I do harm to myself. Si te amo y respeto, if I love and respect you, me amo y respeto yo, I love and respect myself. So as dramaturgs and literary managers being the responsible and conscious gatekeepers of diverse work, how do we include the excluded? What is our role in doing so? What are our limitations? How do we have these conversations and how do we as dramaturgs, a role that's constantly excluded or undermined in performance, use our critical lens to create a space of inclusion while still embracing diversity. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, where are we? Our next speaker is another major contributor to this organization, a current board member of LMDA, a dramaturg and a scholar with a list of publications so long that if I actually enumerated them, uh, she wouldn't have any time to speak. Uh, director of the MA and Theater Arts Program, San Diego State, Shelley Orr! Yes, I promised that Desiree and I, while 
she did just graduate from my program. We did not consult one another, but you might see some similarities in our conversation. Um, so I am going to present a very small case study in which I recognize both my limitations and my power. So when I was asked to dramaturg a production of Lynn Nottage's Sweat at the San Diego Repertory Theater, I was excited. I found the place so timely and its structure fascinating with these two timelines, eight years apart. Uh, I'm familiar with the place setting. Even though I live in San Diego, I do know about Reading, Pennsylvania. That was my first thing. Reading, not reading. Reading, like the San Diego people had to know. Okay. I uh, know, drum joke. Okay. Uh, I am related by marriage to people who are like some of the characters in the play. So I felt comfortable taking on the assignment in some ways and deeply uncomfortable taking on the assignment in other ways. While I felt qualified to talk about the play's overall subject matter and to support the actors and the audience members in getting to know the characters and the world of the play, I felt it ne necessary to recognize the potential for my own unconscious bias and my own limits in the first-hand understanding of a racial uh, discrimination. The central questions of Sweat address how people of a certain part of society view others in society. And when I received the offer to dramaturg the play, I acknowledged this as a very significant potential blind spot for me. Uh, there were two main places, actually, that I felt uncomfortable. Uh, the class of the characters differs greatly from my own class, as does the racial background of three of the central characters. And instead of shying away from this feeling, I asked a question. I know how dramaturg got me, right? <laughs> uh, could another dramaturg do a better job of bringing out the perspectives in this play? That's an uncomfortable question, right? I've been offered this, and I'm like, could someone else do better, right? Uh, as dramaturgs, we don't always, or even often, share the cultural experiences of the playwright and the characters in the plays on which we work. We are always reaching across cultural borders. We're often trying to interpret a text from another time, another region of the world, another cultural context. Uh, we're often, uh, I'm sorry, in part that's what makes dramaturgy so great. The learning, right? We get to do research, the learning. Uh, however, unlike many of those dramaturgy assignments, Sweat is from this moment. Even though the play is set in the years 2000 and 2008, our playwright is actually looking back a decade or more to understand this moment. Uh, when it was written in 2015 and first performed in 2016, and it opened just a week before our shocking election of 2016, the play was hailed as prescient in focusing on this segment of the population that is, it seems, credited with uh, electing uh, the current president we have. Um, so, faced with all that, I felt that adding another dramaturg to the team would be a way to better represent all the perspectives in the play. I decided to accept the assignment, but also request the addition of a co-dramaturg, uh, Kimberly King. We were also joined on the team by Patrice Amon as the assistant director. As a team, Kimberly, Patrice, and I worked together to bring our insights gained both through research and as well as, as through our personal experience, bring that into the rehearsal hall. Uh, with characters like Cynthia and Chris, Kimberly could be more fully able to speak to the questions centered on their action, actions and choices. With a particular <coughs> character in the play like Oscar, Patrice could more fully speak to his experience. And we could all share our reactions to the charged moments in the play. So do I believe that dramaturgs must be cast like actors? I would say sometimes, yes. Yes, I think that if we have that person who has the relevant experience in the room, that is going to definitely add to the experience. Maybe not in all cases, right? Sometimes, you know, do you need to be a French descent to work on Molière? I don't think so, but. <laughs> but the, for other things that plays that are about this moment, about our cultural context, about those kinds of issues, then yes, we do need to make that effort to find the right dramaturg for that experience. As an association, I just want to mark that LMDA has long been in making a concerted effort to expand our membership, um, to seek out and welcome dramaturgs of all backgrounds to the table. Indeed, I was present at Crossing Borders 1, if you will, right? 2003? Okay. Um, and that whole conference was focused on how to better expand our tent and to reach out and to invite in, actively recruit people. Um, as the head of a graduate program, I've been delighted to recruit and admit students who bring their lived experience and cultural perspectives to bear on theater. I'm particularly delighted to mark that I have five graduates of our program here. Uh, we have, uh, well actually five former students that should op open the tent book. So I have Emrita, I have Bernardo, I have uh, Andrea, I have Eli, 
and I have Desiree, of course, and I'm just grateful that they are here and expanding our conversation in the theater uh, here both at our conference and across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is a great advocate of what I'm learning to call civic dramaturgy, just at this conference. Uh, but it's something that I've been interested in since I was a little baby dramaturg, about this high. Uh, <laughs> which is the focus on performance's intersection with, with political culture, and it follows uh, dramaturgy's oldest imperative, which is to use performance culture to make the world a better place. Um, from Arizona State University, Karen G. Martinson. If you were starting from scratch and could build a university dramaturgy lab and intentionally rework your graduate curriculum so that dramaturgical thought and practice were integral to it, where would you begin? At Arizona State University, I am fortunate enough to be at that beginning. I have the opportunity to imagine and then grow and implement both a dramaturgy lab and a dramaturgy curriculum. The prospect is invigorating, but also slightly terrifying. <laughs> as I want to do it well, so that I cultivate the skills of our students while also pushing the boundaries of our field. Jeff Prohl speaks of dramaturgical engagement as the mulch that nourishes a project. And I think that mulch can in fact nourish an entire theater department and perhaps a university. If dramaturgy is threaded through all that we do and all that we teach, we can in fact dramaturg our very thinking about pedagogy as we consider what learning looks like now. This lab and program should, be, should accord with the mission of ASU and the values of the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. ASU declares that it defines itself not by who it excludes, but by who it includes. How can dramaturgy foster radical inclusivity, not just in the shows that we produce, but by the very people we invite in the room? The mission of the Institute says that we will position artists, scholars, and educators at the center of public life using their creative capacities to build community and to transform our society by tackling its most pressing challenges. We value excellence, social embeddedness, and projecting all voices. How can dramaturgy help to make, the, make real these aspirations so that they are not just lofty words on the page, but instead lived enactments? And what future path, whoa, Technology. And what future paths might we see for our students? While I want them to have the skill set to be able to work at any of our nation's top theaters, I'm even more interested in seeing them put their talents to use to create new spaces, to elevate voices that have gone unheard for far too long. These might be theater spaces, but they also might not be. It is less important to me that they make theater so long as they make worthwhile dialogues happen. Success cannot simply be defined by who ends up making it big, landing jobs at prestigious institutions or working on hit shows. Success should be celebrated when students apply critical rigor and dramaturgical thinking and practice in any number of spaces, doing any number of things. This is all new to me, but it isn't necessarily new to you. Or you. <laughs> Uh, I need the wisdom of this room to determine the must-haves, the can't-fails, the avoid-at-all-costs, and most importantly, the never-been-thought-of-befores. I need all of your input, from the faculty side, the student side, to the institutional side, and the freelance side, so that I can create a truly unique, critically engaged, wildly creative dramaturgy lab and curriculum. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, all right, get my notes. Uh, our next speaker is a historian and a performance studies scholar whose work I have uh, relied on for many, many years. Um, she's an advocate for the scholarship of women in theater and African Americans in theater, and she's got the coolest name uh, in the field. Uh, from Ole Miss, Rona Justice. Oh. Good morning. Um, I have a confession to make. I'm a worrier. <laughs> and here's what I worry about. I worry about playwrights. I worry about emerging playwrights. 
And I worry about 50-50 by 2020. So here's what I'm doing about it. Yeah. <laughs> the Department of Theater and Film in partnership with the Sarah Isom Center for Women and Gender Studies and the Yakna Patafa Arts Council has created a residency for an emerging, unpublished, self-identifying woman playwright. And um, this is how it's gonna go. I don't know, has anybody ever visited Oxford, Mississippi in here? Um, Oxford is an amazing town. It's a beautiful place and so is Ole Miss. So our playwright is going to come to Oxford for a residency of 20 days this summer. In fact, in just a few weeks she'll be coming. Um, she will receive a stipend of $4,000 um, local transportation, we have a car for her. Um, housing in a lovely guest house just off of the square in Oxford. Um, many meals and the opportunity to participate in quite a few social events. Their southern hospitality is a thing. <laughs> and it really is in Oxford. We love a reception. <laughs> um, So, um, I'm going to read just this one part because I don't want to mess it up. Our goal is to create an immersive opportunity that provides experiences, connection, and exposure for both the artist and the community in the creative process. We aim to, support for fe to create support for female voices in theater and aid in the development of creation of new work that could be a play, a monologue, devised performance, or an experimental work. But also, and this is really important, we are seeding a love of Mississippi. We are bringing an artist here so that she can understand the roots of Mississippi and experience our creative nature and then send that out into the world and spread the word. So the idea of, of creating a piece is very important, but also the, the, the idea of creating um, a relationship with our community, not just students, is also really, really important to me, us. So when our playwright gets to Oxford, she's gonna have a lot of opportunities. She can go and visit our Greek and Roman antiquities collection um, on campus, which is um, rivaled only by Harvard's. Um, she can go to the Ole Miss Blues Archive, which is the best in the world. She can attend the Faulkner Conference. She can visit Faulkner's home. She can um, go to the Southern Writers Conference. She can um, uh, uh, go to Foodways Alliance. She can uh, experience Clarksdale, Greenwood, Water Valley, and Holly Springs, Mississippi. And I hope to personally take her to the real Moonlight Casino. <laughs> That's a lot to do. But you know what? She doesn't have to do any of that. If she wants to come and hang out, if she wants to sit at the, at the balcony at City Grocery and enjoy a beverage, if she wants to go to the best independent bookstore in the world, Square Books, she can do that. Or she could take a nap. <laughs> the idea is that this is for her, not for us in terms of product, but process. And then the second summer, really quickly, second summer, they're gonna come, during the year, the playwright is gonna work with our, my dramaturgy class and we're gonna give them support, dramaturgical support throughout the year. The next summer, we bring them back to Oxford for another shorter residency in which we will pay for everything and we will also do a full production of that play. Woo! <laughs> That's what we're shooting for and, um, and this will be a recurring project, and we hope to spread the word near and far. Thanks. Hey, uh, our next speaker is a dramaturg, director, and arts manager, whose uh, prowess I can attest to because she saved my bacon on multiple occasions, <laughs> um, whose accomplishments belie her youth, uh, a PhD candidate from the University of Maryland, and one who deserves great, great thanks for the support of this very conference that we are at right now, Lindsay Brock. Hello, thank you, that's very kind. 
Uh, so with an increasing popularity of both dramaturgy and arts administration programs, how can an intersectional praxis of the skills required in both fields inform the work we do and provide dramaturgs with an intradisciplinary toolkit? By LMDA's own count, there are over 60 programs in the US and Canada that either have a dramaturgy program or offer coursework in dramaturgy. I also did a cursory search of the database from the Association of Arts Management Educators, and they cite over 70 programs that produce arts management degrees or related coursework. There are many positions within the academy, professional theater, and non-related theater jobs, which we'll call dramaturgy adjacent for our purposes here, uh, that can directly benefit from those who have a dramaturgical skill set. And I know that my own practice as a dramaturg has been greatly impacted by my work as an arts administrator. So here's a common sentiment that I've heard from undergrad, my master's program, and now in my PhD program. You have to have a CV, CV slash resume, slash portfolio, slash something that shows that you can do more than one thing. Now, obviously, this isn't true for all career paths, uh, but as someone who was interested in dramaturgy in undergrad, uh, moved into arts management for my master's, and now is looking toward the academy, uh, it's a refrain that's all too familiar. It's here where an intersectional praxis is imperative. Speaking from my own experience in professional theater, there are artistic directors and related artistic staff who do not see or do not want to value dramaturgs in an institution. I have been told, we don't need a dramaturg for this production, just program notes. The, the response I ran in my head was, you might not need a dramaturg for this production, but do you need a dramaturg for your institution? I know a few people better equipped than dramaturgs to analyze text and meaning, whether that is saying this meaning to stakeholders that are actors, directors, designers, donors, or executive liaisons. Dramaturgs can provide an essential function in information sharing. Better yet, arts administrators who are dramaturgy adjacent may be equipped to bring these skills into their jobs, creating a more cohesive institutional narrative. Could we save dozens of organizations from potentially extraneous rebranding if there were members of the staff who better understood the crafting of narratives in a way that enhances audience understanding? I gather we could. I'm hopeful that the day is coming where the next round of artistic directors and program directors are also dramaturgs in equal. Three suggestions on how we may get there. Equi one, equipping arts managers with dramaturgical skill sets and vice versa. Knowing how to do financials and textual analysis in the same space may heighten the way we talk about dramaturgy, both in professional theaters and the academy. Two, creating opportunities within the academy and pre-professional programs to prepare students for dramaturgical and dramaturgy adjacent jobs. Are we encouraging the next generation of artists to highlight their dramaturgical training in interviews, whereby staff may witness <coughs> firsthand the importance of dramaturgy in an artistically administrative capacity? Three, create pathways in professional and pre-professional programs wherein dramaturgy is seen as crucial a function as directing, designing, or teaching. If we place value on the role of dramaturgs, both inside the rehearsal room and out, the case may be made that they're as valuable and potentially more so inside artistic directors' offices than other career paths that often lead them elsewhere. In my master's program, I was surrounded by people who did not work in the arts, and frankly, most of them only had a passing familiarity with the artistic institutions throughout the Baltimore and DC region. An exercise that changed the way I think about my work in theater and thus as a dramaturg happened here. I was surrounded by people who had little interest in the arts and saw the, few saw the importance of artistic institutions in their own community. We were often asked to express the following. Why does your work or organization matter? What are you bringing to the community that doesn't exist? In essence, why do we care about what you do? Having to continually express why theater was crucial to our community alongside my colleagues was an extended exercise in dramaturgical thinking. Depending on the audience, the narrative needed to be adjusted, a practice arts administrators and dramaturgs often do that may well be supported by dramaturgy and dramaturgy adjacent folks. I often had to share the stage and state why theater was important and appeal to donors alongside those who were talking about their domestic violence relief shelters, child abuse relief centers, and anti-human trafficking organizations. It is crucial to introduce dramaturgy into arts administration for this very reason. We need to tell a story. I'll leave you with something one of my professors says, Dr. Phaedrus Richard Coppin. Uh, <laughs> um, so she always says, something that continually encouraged me to explore this intersectional praxis, both now in my PhD program and in my freelance career. She says, if you can define in one sentence what dramaturgy is, you're not thinking fully about what dramaturgy can be. Thank you. That's the future.
Um, I have so much to respond to that. Okay. Um, our next speaker is a producer, performer, and maker of experimental children's theater, among other things. She's a voice artist, a uh, dramaturg with a history of collaborations in the U.S. and London, a uh, recent graduate of the MA at the Royal Central uh, in, in London. Yeah, Jess Kaufman. <laughs> Jess Kaufman, she, her, hers. I'm a freelance dramaturg, researcher, creative producer, question mark, um, based in New York, but I'm currently making work uh, in the UK, the US, and Mexico. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about an aspect of dramaturgy and devised theater in hopes of finding some community around the questions that I've been wrestling with in my own practice. Um, and I've heard a lot of talk around in the last day or so um, that relates to what this is, so hopefully we'll be able to have a conversation later about this topic. Um, at the root of the questions that I've been considering in my own practice is what happens to dramaturgical practice when there's no existing text to analyze or engage, and what new potential does that offer us as a field? Um, it feels like a lot of the time a dramaturg is invited into the process only when there's an existing draft, if not a finished play. But as a devising dramaturg, I get to be in the room from the minute the idea occurs, which is really fantastic. Um, a play has a structure. And as I'm really uh, wrestling with in my own practice, so does a creative process. Um, as dramaturgs, we get to observe and critique the structures of meaning and the content and the form and the themes of a play, whether they already exist or whether they're in development, like in a devising room. But I'm particularly obsessed with applying, whenever possible, the same analytical and critical tools to the creative process itself. What are the structures and how we're making this piece? How can our creative process be structured in a way that mirrors the content that we're trying to engage, or the themes or the forms, and what does that offer us? And most importantly, what I'd love to talk to you all about uh, after this is how we go about analyzing the creative process, and what are the benefits of that practice? I think it's a conversation, it, this is in conversation with a lot of the hot topics that we've heard today, and I think a couple that are coming. Um, uh, and it's not really, it's not a new idea. Um, many points came up yesterday in the New Works panel session that evidenced an active dramaturgy process already happening. Uh, for example, Martine talked from a curation standpoint about this question of how are we evaluating new works and how do we adjust our process to address implicit biases. You're probably already practicing process dramaturgy in whatever spheres you work in. Uh, but it's not an idea that I found a ton of, of literature or community or discourse around here in the Americas. I feel like a lot of the literature I've encountered is coming from Europe, and I feel like there's contributions to the field that are maybe more recent that I haven't found, or that are actively happening that I would love to discuss and gather data on. Um, and I think this is a, a particularly topical practice to the theme of this conference, which is crossing borders. You can't cross a boundary that you can't see. And um, the practice of analyzing our creative process from within it forces us to attend to and interrogate the assumptions and boundaries that we have as artists, and which reverberate in our creative processes whether or not we intend or want them to. Um, so a quick example, uh, in 2015, so I primarily make work for young children, and um, I was working on a piece in 2015 with two collaborators. Um, and at the end of the process for a paper, I retroactively analyzed our creative process. Uh, we were trying to make a piece for people of all ages, including young people and adults at the same time. And in reflecting back on the creative process, I found a critical assumption that we'd made about the theatrical competence of young children, which defined a huge aspect of the work we were making. It ended up discarding part of our intended audience, and it uh, held us back from a whole set of creative possibilities in the work itself. It also illuminated ways in which I, as an artist for young audiences, was underestimating the audience I wanted to serve. So it really allowed me to make an evolution in my own artistic practice. And I guess I realized like, if I had attended to that uh, process of our making from the get-go, from within it, maybe I would have seen that moment and as a dramaturg been able to give us as a group an active choice about it, been able to highlight what are the structures that we're using to make this piece and how can we make more active choices about how we're making what we're making. And those kinds of hidden assumptions are always present in what we're making because we're all human. And attending to them has the potential to highlight the boundaries and exclusions in our work that we're not even aware of at the start. As a queer artist, attending to things that are excluded is something I'm particularly passionate about, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that in this room. Um, again, this, was, this came up yesterday. It's not a new idea. But I think that process dramaturgy is something that we could be talking about more and more publicly and engaging with at the university level as well. Um, and it goes right alongside production dramaturgy and a reflect, uh, uh, audience reception dramaturgy and textual dramaturgy. They're all reflexive to each other and um, 
without really looking at the dramaturgical process of how we're making what we're making, we can't evolve our art form. So we, I think, if we insist on being in the room as early as possible, whether it's a devised process or a traditional process, we as dramaturgs have the power to really look at our art form and how we're making what we're making and what can change and what we want to change so that American theater can continue to evolve and welcome new perspectives and new voices and move more towards this experiential global generation of makers, artists, and audiences that are coming up today. How we go about this is a big question. Um, I have personally developed a very strong critical reflective practice that helps me engage with the process from within it, and I'd love to hear your ideas and tools for doing so as well. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Jess. Uh, our next speaker is a Brooklyn play, Bro Bro Brooklyn based uh, new play director and dramaturg with credits at La Mama, uh, the Edinburgh Fringe, and the International Human Rights Festival. Rachel Levin! Hi, so the hot topic that I'm presenting on is playwrights and residents at the university level. I believe that we need to create theater pedagogy, pedagogies that give the new play development process of equal emphasis as we do realism and classical text. It is our responsibility as theater makers and gatekeepers to increase sustainable artistic practices and diversity within the field of theater. We need to re-examine the new play development process and give playwrights the opportunity to get paid to write plays. I also believe that representation matters. And many times students, when they're pursuing their BFA and BAs, they do not feel represented in the theater season that is chosen. This often sometimes leads to problematic casting choices at the undergraduate level, and then this translates into the real world. There is an erasure that occurs when we have problematic casting. I think we can build a bridge with these seemingly disparate problems. I believe we can make artistic livelihoods better for playwrights and for undergraduate theater majors by employing playwrights to be <coughs> artists and residents at universities and commissioning them to write plays for the undergraduate cohort. Having a playwright in residence would allow students to work on developing new plays with a playwright directly in the room. Young directors, dramaturgs, designers, and actors would have the chance and practical experience of working with a playwright. Students would learn how to navigate asking questions in a room when working with that playwright, how to be flexible with rewrites, and would get to experience helping a playwright uncover something they didn't even know existed in their play. Young theater makers would also learn that nothing is set in stone and that rewrites are a good sign because the playwright is learning what is and isn't working with their show. I believe a Playwrights in Residence program would be a symbiotic relationship for universities and playwrights because working on a new play creates a more process-oriented pedagogy and students would have, um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> the Playwright in Residence would be able to leave their residency with a new play that not only had it developmental support, but also a student production. I also believe that having a playwright in residence would allow a students to engage in dialogue with a playwright on multiple levels. The playwright in residence um, would have the opportunity to lead lectures, hold moderated discussions, have special topics classes about their process with the undergraduate students. The playwright in residence could even have open office hours where students could watch them write or write alongside them. This would mirror what Susan Laurie Parks is doing in the lobby at the Public Theater, Watch Me Work, which uh, and in this performance, she welcomes anybody to the lobby to write with her or watch her write for 40 minutes. And then after those 40 minutes are complete, there is a Q&A with Susan Laurie Parks, where Parks discusses questions about um, process and also the, and people can talk about their own creative process or what they're coming up against. I know having a Playwrights in Residence program is not a new concept. Um, University is already taking this on. Rutgers has a Playwrights in Residence where they've welcomed Martina Mayock, Madeline George, David Ajmi, and Anne Washburn, just to name a few. Club Thumbs Directing Fellows and Club Thumbs Playwrights are also welcome to NYU's Playwrights Horizon School to workshop shows. Ole Miss sought out uh, women playwrights for a 20-day summer residency in Oxford, Mississippi. I would like to challenge anyone that is teaches or that works at the university level to bring this back to your institution, or if you work for a regional theater, that you start to create a commission program as well. 
I'm also going to ask that you specifically invite playwrights to this program that were mentioned in yesterday's session, playwrights under the radar, or that you are getting playwrights from the Kilroy's list. If we want to define and create theater for the 21st century, we need to find every way we can to commission and support playwrights. We need to write plays. We need to give them space, time, and financial support to do their shows. We need to create the world we want to see represented on stage. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. All right, our next speaker uh, was the recipient of the 2017 Dramaturgy Driven Grant right here at LMDA. Tells me she's still working on it. Uh, a veteran of the Arkansas New Play Festival, the Hartford Stage, and a performer at the Lincoln Center. Yes. Uh, please welcome Amy Jensen. Whether as, whether as part of a course, degree, internship, application, or time of change, dramaturgs are evaluated and assessed. How are we structuring these processes to encourage growth? So, a word about growth. You're a natural. <laughs> Hearing that can feel fantastic. Uh, psychologists caution how character, trait, or ability-based feedback can support rigid or fixed identity beliefs. So if you're a natural, then things should come naturally. Hard work is for people who aren't naturals. So if I have to work hard, I'm not a natural. If I reach a point where it no longer feels natural, then there must be something wrong with me, or I should hide from the suspicion that I'm a fraud. So a challenge is that evaluations can be internalized not as just an evaluation of work, but ability, character, and identity. Am I talented, creative, intelligent enough? Especially, this is especially challenging in a talent-focused field, or one that can appear to be. Um, this is a fixed mindset rather than a growth mindset. Uh, Carolyn Dwick had written about that in 2006 that a growth mindset focuses on processes and a belief that effort, choices, and strategies can lead to growth. Many of you are involved in evaluations, assessments, and developing the criteria behind them. Can you help this process emphasize growth? Can you review how criteria is framed and defined so it's clear it's based on choices and actions? For example, being you're a collaborator versus you listen to others, you share your ideas, you ask for help, you accept criticism, you take responsibility, you negotiate, you compromise, and so on. Or professionalism. Uh, when we have the implicit definition, this criteria might be faulty. I don't believe that anyone has not met someone who hasn't had the assumption that to be professional is to not need help and to not need, not make mistakes. We need to define the choices and strategies that someone makes instead to be professional. Review of the criteria is framed in a way to encourage further experience and study. I will forever remember an uh, AP theater, uh, AP English class in which the rubric said pedestrian thinking. Um, <laughs> could it instead have said analyze the parts to the whole, draw out complexity and differences in comparison, something that I could more easily think towards taking action. Share criteria beforehand, before the evaluation happens. Encourage individuals to record their actions and choices and strategies when they come to meet and speak with you if it is a live evaluation. Can you consider what extent people are involved in the processes defining the criteria of how they should be evaluated? So for example, in an ideal situation, of a, especially I think of an internship, what if someone was asked, what is your goal with this? What were the steps that will help you get there? What obstacles might be in your way? What strategies can you use that you will need to employ? If you have been in an internship, you might have had an experience when uh, this was asked of you. Uh, I found in my three internships, this wasn't always the case. If you are working with students who are going to do an internship, you could support them in being able to define them this, self, this for themselves and to present this to the theater if the theater is not introducing this. How do your evaluations acknowledge and value effort and work? And what will help facilitate that? Is there a track or a record being made either on your part or theirs? What are effective questions to encourage developing strategies to deal with obstacles? And how can the assessment and reflection process include modeling ways to deal constructively with critical feedback as a way to grow? 
I think this can also be part of a larger culture of what are the stories that we're telling within our organizations about success? How much time do we spend highlighting the effort, the persistence, the challenges that have been overcome? We believe in growth. We believe in reflection. Let's help make that explicit. Thank you, Amy. Okay, our last speaker is, uh, unfortunately for you, me. Um, and uh, I want to start with a, a little bit of a, a straw poll. I, I really don't want to call anybody out here, but um, how many of you have read Lessing's Hamburg Dramaturgy? Okay, now, please, no, keep your hand up, please. Keep your hand up, please keep your hand up. Okay, now, put your hand down if you are also uh, fluent in German. Okay. Sorry, let's try this again. I'm going to try again, all right? And folks at home, playing the home game at HowlRound, you guys can do this too, all right? Ready? Now, we're going to start all over again. Now, listen carefully, dramaturgs. How many of you have read Lessing's book, The Hamburg Dramaturgy? Okay, now, please, keep your hand up if you do not also read German. So in other words, if you read German, you would put your hand down. Okay, no, no, keep your hands up. All right, everybody who does not read German, who thinks they have read the Hamburg Dramaturgy, is wrong. <laughs> that includes me. Because if you have read the English translation of the Hamburg Dramaturgy, you have read the work of Helen Zimmern, who was a fantastic uh, philosopher, German, English, intellectual uh, of Jewish extraction, who was very interested in trying, this is in the 1890s, she was very interested in trying to stem the rising tide of fascism and anti-Judaism in Germany as early as the 1890s by popularizing the most conscientious, the most civil rights oriented, the most forward thinking, compassionate German philosophers of the time. And Lessing was the head of that list, right? Helen Zimmern was not interested in the theater. Helen, interest, Helen Zimmer was interested in philosophy that advances compassion, empathy, and justice, okay? So her agenda was to translate that, that part of Lessing that was interested in that. And maybe you guys don't know this, but Lessing, uh, you know, despite the fact that he was a uh, dead white man, right? Which I'm like, yeah, right? But he was a huge advocate for civil rights of Jews in Germany at the time. Uh, his best friend, Moses Mendelssohn, who was uh, one of the great translators of Spinoza uh, into German and, and one of the great philosophers of the day, could not enter Hamburg except through the cattle gate because he was Jewish. Uh, of course, in the next two centuries, that was going to, uh, that anti-Jewish sentiment was going to result in, in Holocaust and pogroms all over uh, Europe. So, um, uh, Helen Zimmern saw that coming, she tried to stop it, and that was the translation of the Hamburg Dramaturgy. When uh, Grove Press, in, um, in, by, uh, under Victor Lang, reprinted this in the 1960s, it was just the reprint of that original edition, and then when they reprinted it again in the 1980s, it was just a reprint of that, that edition. So there's only been one English translation of the Hamburg Dramaturgy, it was Helen Zimmern's, it's fine, except that it doesn't have any theater in it. <laughs> So what you don't know about Lessing is that he was passionately interested in gesture, in stage pictures, in the work of the actor, in the specific actor personalities, in, in, um, in engagement, in, in blah. There is like 40% of that book is missing, and it's all the stuff that we are the most interested in. Now, Lessing may be, you know, part of this uh, particular intellectual tradition that we are trying to branch out from, and I am uh, a huge proponent of that, but the truth is, is that dramaturgy around the world, right now, to this day, shapes itself according to what Lessing wrote. So you owe it to yourselves to read this book. I don't say buy it, because it's expensive, but read it <laughs> from, your, um, from your local uh, university library, because they should have it. So this is it. The new, yeah? Did you read this one? Yeah. All right, then I, then I, I, I apologize. <laughs> this, is, this is the Hamburg Dramaturgy by G.E. Lessing, new and complete English translation, annotated. The main work of this was done by Wendy Ahrens. Uh, yeah, that's right. And Sarah Fidel, um, and uh, a lot of the editing work, there's, a, there's tons of annotations, everything you could possibly imagine that you might need about this book, uh, by Natalia uh, Baldiga, who was formerly at Tufts, 
And, um, and I played a big role in this. Um, I didn't do a lot of the content work, but I did a lot of the fundraising, and, and uh, I wrote uh, an essay for it. Um, I guess I was a project manager. Um, that talks a lot about this organization um, and ends with a quote from Dr. Martine Kai Green Rogers, uh, who was at the time, and still is, the president of the Liberty Managers of Drama Tours of the Americas, which is this. We are indebted to Lessing's advocacy of the field without being beholden to how he originally thought of the work in the theory of dramaturgy. That, I think, is the brilliance of the field that he helped forefront. He realized the true value of dramaturgy may only manifest if we are on the front lines with theaters so that the field of dramaturgy may grow in tandem with the art itself. Back in black. All right, that is all the time we have for today. I want to take a moment, for sure, and give big thanks to the staff and volunteers uh, here at Columbia University. Uh, and the staff, our tech crew up there, thanks to the at home. Uh, of course, to, uh, to uh, Dr. Kai Green, uh, president of the of LMDA. Hey, Key. Key. That's even better, rhymes more. Uh, uh, Brian Court is head of the board, and Brian Moore, uh, who has been holding my hand ever since I became the VP of Educational Research. I also want to thank our room captains, Lauren Sheely, and um, if you would come up here, please, Lavina Jawani, come up here for a second. Um, she has a team of doing this. Lavina, uh, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the work of this woman. Not only has she been my room captain, and this is amazing, but um, way back when I, uh, at the beginning of my professional career, uh, Vina was my very first dramaturgy student at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Ever. And, and she helped create the program at Carnegie Mellon University. She helped design it, and she helped write Ghostlight because she helped articulate what was the most important things for students to know. And uh, her work is amazing. So she beat me, she beat CMU, and I really wanted to share with you guys that she also beat cancer. Yay. So.